Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm Carla Roslin, a co-founder of the Global Immunotox, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you today our global immunospeaker, Dr. Mark Slomczyk. I've known Mark for many decades now, so Mark, it's very, very special to be together today here and have you as a global immunospeaker. So let me tell you some facts about Mark. Mark was born in Philadelphia, and I mm. guess he must love Pennsylvania because he had spent <laughs> a lot of his life uh, in that beautiful state. So he received uh, his MD degree and his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and he also completed his residency in pathology and lab medicine at UPenn. He continued working with Martin Whitewer, with whom he worked during his PhD, as a postdoctoral fellow at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And then he decided to move states and came to Yale, where I had mm. the pleasure to have Mark as a colleague for quite some time. Now, 10 years ago, I guess Mark could not resist the exciting opportunity to lead the Department of Immunology at the University of Pittsburgh. And 10 years is a good time. And when this amount of time passes by, you can reflect. And honestly, I can see that you have done an extraordinary job as a leader of that department, recruiting wonderful colleagues, particularly very young colleagues that you have nurtured over the years. So I think this has been a phenomenal part of your scientific life. Now, when it comes to research, I have the impression that Mark is absolutely obsessed about B cells and autoantibodies. And he's also laser focused on the mechanisms that drive autoimmunity, something that I think we're going to learn more about today. Now, on a personal note, uh, I think it's obvious that Mark is absolutely committed to advancing science. I think for all of us that know Mark, we have experienced this through his thought-provoking questions. During his years at Yale, there was not one seminar in which Mark would not ask a very, very insightful question. He has trained over 50 students, uh, many of them going on to several independent wonderful positions and recently celebrated 30 years of his independent laboratory. He has received many awards like the Lupus Insight Prize and an NIH mm -hmm. Merit Award. And we are absolutely delighted to have you today, Mark, to learn about your findings on the genetic dissection of the TLR paradox in lupus. Now, before we get to the science and the beautiful discoveries that your lab has been doing, we would love to ask you a question. And so what we would like to learn from you today is about your mentorship style, something that I guess you have employed over so many years, three decades of your independent scientific life. So what's yeah, your- well, Thank you, Carla. And thanks for the super nice introduction. Um, so yeah, mentorship style. Um, I think it, you know, probably the most important thing that we do is to mentor the next generation of scientists. So it's extremely important. And I would say that my style has maybe evolved over the years a little bit. When I first started, I, I was very concerned about like being fair and treating everybody the same. And I think being fair is super important um, within the lab. Uh, but then I realized that actually the, the most important thing a mentor can do is try to figure out what the mentee really needs. In other words, to adjust yourself to the style of the person that you're mentoring so that you don't clash and you can kind of bring out their strengths um, and help them work on the things that they want to work on. So I would say that's something that I think about all the time. What, how much time, how much attention, the kinds of attention that people need. And at the same time, I feel like striking a balance between, you know, paying attention and, you know, providing ideas and providing insight and 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 um, feedback with giving a person enough independence to really develop themselves. Um, I think science progresses mostly when we make mistakes um, and things don't work out. So I think you have to give people room and have and have patience for that. But at the same time, you know, always accentuating the positive aspects 
of the things that we're learning and that they're doing. So I think it's balance um, in that way. And that's what I've always looked for, whether mentoring students or postdocs or junior faculty members, uh, wh whatever it is. So thank you. Thank is meaningful in some way. But Absolutely. That's what I thank try you to do. so yeah. much. And thank you for mm. sharing yeah, your honest discovery as you evolved as a mentor as well and how your mentorship style evolve over time uh, okay wonderful so we are all ears so let's see if you can share your all screen. right this is the moment of truth yes i think it should and work. i share the all screen share. yes we actually have practiced this exactly there we go so yeah before i start <laughs> so everyone can see um you've got my laser pointer it's yes. all good great all, all right so um before i start just want to um first of all uh thank uh, the organizers for putting together uh, this series of talks. I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing that we're doing. And I guess it's one of the, you know, <clears throat> the benefits of the COVID pandemic era that uh, that we can get together and do get together and do this. Um, and at the same time, I also want to thank everybody for tuning in, uh, for being interested um, in this topic. I am possibly the only B-cell speaker in the whole series. Uh, but yet, as you all know, B cells do really do important things, including provide protection in uh, to after vaccination, but also are very important in driving autoimmunity and a variety of diseases. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to talk about, uh, in that context, the genetic dissection of what we call the TLR paradox uh, in lupus. And before I go on, and this is actually another point I should have made to to um to Carla, I think that giving credit to people, like not for the work that they do, is really another important aspect of being a mentor. Uh, definitely not usurping uh, their credit. And also in my lab, if you come and you do a postdoc, you can take anything with you that you want to. Um, and I think that's a you know being generous. I think is really very important. Um, I will always find something else to do. So if you want to come do a postdoc, you know you can take it with you. And this is a perfect example. This is Claire Liebler. She was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Um, and she did uh, the great majority of the work that I'm going to talk about today. And I'll come back to this at the end uh, uh, and explain that a little bit more. But I just want to get her up front. So what is the role of TLRs in lupus? And then what is the TLR paradox? This is what we're going to talk about today. But I have to kind of explain this as background. and. To, so that we can get to the mechanistic studies uh, that I'm going to present um, today. So kind of the most important maybe discovery in the field that we made um, quite a number of years ago uh, by Sean Christensen is that um, when I was at Yale is the TLR9 and TLR7 control distinct aspects of the anti-nuclear antibody staining pattern. Most of you are aware this is the sine qua non, this is the diagnostic feature of lupus, but many autoimmune diseases have a positive ANA. And what we're looking at here, maybe it's a little easier to see, well, it's probably better this way, um, is an anti-chromatin antibody. Um, that is the metaphase plate. Um, this is a wild type mouse. And you can see that it's being stained. So that's anti-chromatin. This is another uh, wild type mouse. And you can see actually at the anaphase, you can see the chromosomes being stained. So what we discovered when we started to knock out TLRs in lupus prone mice was that if you knock out TLR9, you have a positive ANA, but if you look closely, it's actually different. And you see the negative staining pattern of now the anaphase plates. So these mice have anti-nuclear antibodies, but they're actually anti-RNA antibodies. They don't have anti-DNA antibodies. If you knock out TLR7, you see this beautiful, very clean nuclear staining pattern. Um, these mice have lots of anti-DNA. You can see it here. They are not staining the cytoplasm, and that's because these mice lack anti-RNA type antibodies. But most critically, if you knock out both TLR9 and TLR7, you completely lose the ANA. And as would be expected, if you knock out the signal transducer MITE88 or TLR7 and 9, um, you basically lose the ANA. So um, the entire anti-nuclear antibody uh, responses is, is dependent on this. And this has been replicated in, in other models. So we all thought, okay, great. We have the answer. We'll just 
inhibit TLR9, block the anti-DNA antibodies, and the mice will get better. So we looked at disease in TLR9 deficient mice, and this is a survival curve. And like, you want this curve to be like, these are the wild type mice and these are the knockouts, but that's not what we found. It's the opposite. Um, so these are the wild type mice. They're, they're, they're dying of lupus, but when you knock out TLR9, it's a much more accelerated death um, and they get much worse disease. And that is the TLR, essentially the essence of the TLR paradox. Why, when you knock out a TLR that seems important for creating all the uh, DNA specific nuclear antibodies, do the mice actually get much worse? I mean, they're actually even hard to breed. And so <clears throat> this was extended uh, by work from many different labs um, to show that actually TLR9 regulates, but yet TLR9 promotes lupus. So TLR9 knockouts were made on all these different lupus models and they all got worse disease. But if you knocked out MIDI 88, you got better disease. Um, and if you knocked out TLR7, disease was also improved. Or if you knock out a molecule called unc 93 b which we'll talk about, which is important for um, signaling by, um, and, and well, we'll talk about exactly how, of TLR7 and 9. But basically, these mice are a functional knockout. Or if you knock out 7 and 9, you get, you get less disease. So two TLRs, 7 and 9, that both control different parts of the anti-nuclear antibody response and are both highly homologous, and the textbook says they function the same, they have very opposite roles um, in lupus. And more even beyond that, we were able to show that exacerbated disease, in this case, glomerulonephritis is an example, in TLR9 knockout mice actually requires TLR7. So here we're showing genotypes on the bottom, glomerulonephritis score on the y-axis. You could see the TLR9 knockout mice have worse disease, but when we combine that with TLR7 knockout, so TLR7 is on the X chromosome, when you um, combine that, you lose the exacerbated disease. So there is some kind of a genetic uh, interaction between TLR9 such that TLR7 deficiency short circuits the deregulation. Okay, so that sets up the, what the paradox is and the questions really that we were fo focusing on were really why do TLR9 and 7 have these opposite impacts. And within that realm, there's two uh, sub-questions that we're going to focus on today. One is, how does TLR9 regulate TLR7? I just showed you that um, TLR7 and 9 have at least the genetic interactions. And then what are the mechanisms of protection by TLR9? What is it doing to be uh, protective? So around the time or a little bit after these discoveries that I was just showing you were published, an interesting hypothesis uh, came up um, sir, around uh, this chaperone molecule called UNC93B that was um, generated by a series of very nice papers by the Miyake lab. And we, so we call it the Miyake hypothesis. And what that hypothesis is, is that TLR9 limits TLR9 trafficking by competing for UNC93B and thus it curtails autoimmunity. And I would say this is still, in many people's minds, uh, the main um, working explanation. And the way they came up with this was they found a mutant called uh, D34A in UNC93B, and this mutant binds TLR7 better. So in the context of this mutant, you actually move more TLR7 um, into the endosome. Um, so seven is always blue and nine is always red in all of this whole talk. So before, this without this mutant, the idea is you have more TLR9. When you have the mutant, this mutant moves more TLR7, therefore you get more TLR7 signaling and you get more autoimmunity. This was the idea. And I would say these papers did not really test that idea. They mainly studied this, the, the nature of this mutant. So the thought was, okay, if you don't have any TLR9 at all, when it's absent, there should be no competition for UNC93B and thus there should be even more TLR7 that goes to the endosome, more TLR7 signaling and more lupus. And of course that would fit with the data that I have already just shown you. But there was a little wrinkle in all of this that I couldn't get myself around. And that is that the signaling qualities of seven and nine must be different. In other words, what difference does it make if you have more seven or more nine if they both signal exactly the same? 
Um, and the, the textbook said they both signal through MIDE 88. So it shouldn't really matter uh, whether you have all TLR7 or all TLR9, um, unless there would be more TLR7 than there would the combination of the red TLR9 plus the blue TLR7. So hopefully everybody's with me um, that the, the implication of the hypothesis is that there either has to be more of this or that actually the TLR7 signaling is somehow greater than the TLR9 uh, signaling plus the TLR7 signaling. So the predictions of the Miyake hypothesis are as follows. There should be more TLR7 protein in TLR9 knockout mice. Um, I, I just showed you the biochemical idea behind that. Um, TLR7 and 9 should co-localize inside the cell because if they are not in the same place, then they can't really compete with each other. So they have to be together for this competition idea to, to make sense. Uh, there should be more TLR7 signaling in TLR9 knockout mice. Um, that's a very key prediction. And so it turns out that actually none of these things was tested. So we decided to go ahead and, and, and test and test them. Now, you have to study these questions in B cells. And although TLRs are expressed and maybe even important in autoimmunity and, uh, and non B cells, we were able to show um, that B cell intrinsic TLR9 expression is protective in murine lupus. And moreover, so in other words, um, if you just knock out TLR9 in the B cell, you get worse lupus in essence. And we had previously shown that B cell TLR expression and MyD88 signaling was important um, and that signaling in, for example, dendritic cells and other myeloid cells was not so important. And we recently showed, and Haley is a, a grad student in my lab, um, she showed that B cell intrinsic TLR7 expression drives severe lupus. So for both TLR7 driving lupus and TLR9 regulating lupus, the action from a genetic standpoint um, is in the B cells. So therefore, it was important to study these TLRs in the B cells. And I'll say that almost all the TLR literature does not take place in B cells. There is some, a little bit, but almost all of it's either in macrophages or in uh, like cell lines like hex cells. So we wanted to look at TLR7 expression um, in B cells. And actually in follicular B cells, I'm not showing it, there's absolutely no differences, but it's not expressed that much. So here we're looking at three genotypes, the wild type, the nine heterozygote, and the nine knockout. And you can see as you lower TLR9 expression in these male mice, you see absolutely no difference in TLR7. Now there was a slight difference, which was significant uh, when we lowered it in the females. Now we're looking here at marginal zone B cells. This is a subset of B cells that has the most um, TLR7 expression. Um, but I would point out that male TLR9 deficient mice get worse disease, just like females, but they have actually no expression differences. So this, uh, just look at the scale, it's like up to 1.15 versus 1.0. So it's not very much um, and it doesn't track with disease in the males. Then we looked using confocal uh, microscopy at co-localization between TLR7 and TLR9. This is the raw data and this is the IMERIS analyzed data. And what you can see is that only a small fraction of the TLR7 positive endosomes are co-localized with TLR9, just as a point of information in B cells. So the TLR9 endosomes are in red. They tend to be bigger. And as you can see, they tend to basically be different from where the TLR7 blue endosomes are. So they're not really, in, mostly not in the same place. Um, and then we also looked at whether the loss of TLR9 would relocalize uh, endosomal uh, localization or numbers. Um, and that turned out to be not the case. So here, the circles are the wild types and the white are the knockouts. And you can see there's no difference um, in early, early endosomal localization or late endosomal uh, localization. Probably most importantly, there was just no increase in TLR7 dependent signaling. Uh, now, granted, this is limited because we are using an, an, a drug like agonist, but nonetheless, it should be very, quite reflective of what's going on in terms of TLR7 molecule regulation. And this is just um, nuclear localization of NF kappa B. And you can see these two genotypes 
are right on top of each other. There's really no difference with, when you get rid of um, TLR9. And, and a lot I should, should have said a lot of this has been published. In fact, a lot of this talk was published um, in Claire's paper um, that came out about a year ago in Nature Immunology. And at the end, I will talk about some new and I think exciting um, unpublished data. But if you want to see more details on this, uh, there's a lot more in there. So here's how the Miyake hypothesis shakes out. They, the, the predictions just weren't borne out. There should be more TLR7 protein in the TLR9 knockout. But in fact, the males are equal and maybe a tiny little bit more in the females. Uh, they should co-localize in, in the cell. Uh, most TLR7 is not co-localized. And perhaps most important, there should be more TLR7 signaling in TLR9 knockout mice. And as I just showed you, that did not really um, come to pass. And I should add, um, I don't have time to really go over this at all, but Greg Barton's uh, lab has been coming at this from another point of view. And I would say that um, most of their data also is really not consistent with the Miyake hypothesis either. So um, this made us think, okay, we need some new ideas here. We need some new things to test. <clears throat> and we wanted to develop some thoughts about how then TLR9 could be um, differentially regulating disease because it clearly does. And one idea which is not so different from the Miyake hypothesis, but it's a little bit more general is that TLR9 might have some kind of a scaffold function, like just the mere presence of the protein might change things or remodel things um, independent of signaling, um, regardless of what it does with UNC93B. <clears throat> Um, another idea was the TLR7 signals more strongly via MyD88, and we'll come back to this. We're going to come back to all these, actually. Um, a thought that we had was that maybe TLR9 has a unique regulatory signaling module. So it's doing something different in the way it signals from TLR7. Uh, and then a, another thought was that anti-DNA antibody could regulate disease. So if you don't have TLR9, you don't make anti-DNA antibodies. And maybe this anti-DNA is actually clearing a lot of the autoantigen and, and in a cell extrinsic way is, is reducing uh, disease. <clears throat> so we set about to test this by making mutants of TLR9. Um, first, we made them obviously in vitro, but then we made them um, genomically in, in mice using uh, CRISPR and Cas9 um, directly in the MRL LPR as well as in the biopsy background. So one, the first mutant that I'm going to tell you about is, is the K51E point mutant. And this is an inhibitor of ligand binding. It's in the endosomal domain. Um, and, and this was came from the literature. Someone else had already shown this. Um, and indeed, um, this, I'm just going to give you some background. So it doesn't affect TLR9 expression. The mutant's going to be in orange always in the wild type in black. Um, and it, and it, it greatly uh, reduces... TLR9 signaling, this is probably a little bit too small uh, to see, but um, there's just no um, nuclear localization um, in the K51E mutant. So to summarize this, we have three genotypes, the wild type and the knockout, and now we're introducing the K51E. It has complete TLR expression, just like the wild type, but unlike the wild type, it doesn't bind ligand, it doesn't signal. So it's, it's just the same as the nine knockout, in terms of no ligand binding and no signaling. It's just in one case, the protein's there, in the other case, the protein's not. So what happens? So this is the survival curves. And again, as I've shown you before, the wild type mice are here. The knockouts don't do as well, um, just replicating our earlier data. But here you can see if we just restore K51E, um, the, the survival becomes quite similar between the wild type and the knockout. And it's clearly different um, and quite statistically significantly different from the, the knockout. So the wild type and K51E are similar. And if you look at markers of disease like glomerulonephritis score, you can see that the K51E is much like the wild type and different from the knockout and the same for interstitial uh, nephritis. So TLR9 expression without ligand confers protection. So that is a green mark or a green box for the TLR9 scaffold function, independent of signaling. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's going on. So to further probe this, we made another mutant that does bind ligand, but cannot signal through MIDE88. 
And this is the P915H mutant that's in the tier domain. This is the toll IL-1 receptor uh, signaling domain that um, will couple with MID88. These, uh, this TLR9, for whatever reason, only expresses at half the normal level, so right there. So we compared this with the heterozygote. Um, just to control for the amounts of TLR9 protein. So these have exactly the same amount of TLR9 protein. <clears throat> and again, there's no nuclear nf cap b nuclear localization in the mutant, homozygous mutant, compared to the TLR9 heterozygote. So here's the scorecard for these mutants. So we've got, again, the knockout does nothing. The P915H has half the expression. It does bind ligand. There's nothing wrong with its ligand binding domain, but it just can't signal through MID88. And here's the HET, it binds ligand and it can signal through MID88, that's shown right here. So here is the survival curve. And, and in this case, you can really see, uh, it's kind of small, but I will show you that the TLR9 point mutant is actually uh, even more protected than the TLR9 uh, intact animal here. And both, and it's significantly different also from the TLR9 knockout. And again, here is the point mutant. Um, it's got much less glomerulonephritis now than either the knockout or the wild type, and much less interstitial nephritis than either the knockout or the wild type. So we can say that the TLR9 P915H, the non mid 88 signaling but ligand binding mutant, really actually suppresses disease. Um, and it's different from the, the, the wild type. So the amounts of protein are the same, they both bind ligand, but only the wild type can bind MID88 and it has more disease. So that shows that there's a cryptic, although TLR9 overall is regulatory, under the right circumstances, you can reveal a cryptic pro-inflammatory signal because the only difference between these two is that the wild type can signal through MID88 and yet there is more disease um, in the wild type than the P915H. This result also ruled out that the lack of anti-DNA explains the phenotype because both TLR9 knockouts and P915H mice don't have anti-DNA antibodies. But as I just showed you, these guys are super protected and these guys have quite a lot of disease. And that is just summarized here. Neither one has DNA antibodies, but the, wild, the knockout has a lot of disease and the P915H has the least amount of disease. So this adds more stuff to our, our model figure. So the scaffold function is reinforced. I just showed you that MID88, TLR9, MID88 signaling cryptically promotes disease. It is both regulatory and pro-inflammatory. We ruled out the anti-DNA uh, part, um, but we were thinking that it does suggest that maybe TLR9 could have a unique regulatory signaling uh, module. Um, that, that suppresses disease even more than the wild type. Um, and so to look at that, we decided to directly compare the K51E non-ligand binding to the P915H mice that do bind ligand. Neither one can signal through MID88. The P915H can bind ligand, um, and they both have equal expression because we're using the K51E heterozygotes. So the point here would be if the P915H was more protected, that would say that there is something that's ligand dependent that's actually regulatory that is dominantly protective. And indeed, that is what we found. So if you look at glomerulonephritis score or interstitial nephritis score, you can see that the P915H mutant is more protected than the K51E in both of these scores. Now, these mice are more protected. I have already shown you that than the wild type. So, but this again, so there's not much bandwidth to detect more protection, but there is more protection with P915H in these two scores. When we looked at survival, and again, because both of these mice have ameliorated disease, it didn't quite reach significance and we did not go back and redo this cohort. But it was, when you look at the whole totality of the data with the two, um, the two uh, objective markers plus survival, um, it, I think it's clear that uh, P915H is more protected than the K51E. So there is a bit more disease here than here, and that tends to imply a MID88 
um, dependent um, protective role. So here's how we would put this all together. So the, in the wild type TLR9, you've got actually three things going on. It's got scaffold dependent regulation. It's mere presence is regulatory. Um, it's got MIDI 88 independent, some kind of regulatory signaling. So regulatory is here in green. And it's got MIDI 88 dependent pro-inflammatory signaling. That's the cryptic um, signal. The nine knockout doesn't have any of these. And I think that the dominant feature of this getting rid of this mixture is you've gotten rid of more of the regulatory component than the pro-inflammatory. This pro-inflammatory component can be taken care of just fine as long as TLR7 is around. Then you have the non-ligand binding K51E. It's only got this, the scaffold dependent regulation, because there's no ligand. It can't turn on pro-inflammatory MIDI88 dependent signaling or anti-inflammatory MIDI88 independent signaling. And then the P915H, which is subtly but interestingly different, it, it's got scaffold dependent regulation because it doesn't turn on the pro-inflammatory part, but the protein is there, but it's more protected than the K51E, indicating that it, it may have MIDI88 independent signaling. So, so far I've shown you what's going on in the global knockout, but as I asserted at the beginning, B cells is where the action is. So what we wanted to figure out was whether there were B cell intrinsic effects of these TLR9 mutant genotypes. We could not go in, it was not practical to go in and make these mutations using fancy methods just in B cells. So what we did is we made a mixed, a triple mixed bone marrow chimera. And we are just taking a, a normal mouse and irradiating it and putting in wild type, nine heterozygote, and P915H bone marrow into these animals. And all the bone marrow sources are allotype marked with CD45, so we can track them all. When they go into this animal, um, after a long time of reconstitution and let, letting them age, disease will be driven by the wild type and the TLR9 knockout um, hematopoietic systems. But the differential effects on the B cells will be cell intrinsic. So they're all in exactly the same environment. And so we can look at differences in B cell differentiation and activation and ask what was the B cell intrinsic role of these different TLR uh, genotypes during disease. And we looked at this in early and late disease. I'm just gonna show you the late disease um, in the interest of time. So here we're comparing TLR9 wild type mice with TLR9 deficient mice. So there's three ways of, of looking at these comparisons. I'm gonna show you all of them. And so this is a competition score, um, just looking at whether the wild type genotype is favored or the TLR9 genotype is favored. And so it's, and then here are the categories, follicular, marginal zone, germinal center, um, age associated B cell. This is a memory B cell uh, compartment, plasma blasts and plasma cells. <clears throat> and it's easy to see that in every case, there is a, anywhere from a maybe twofold to a fourfold favoring of the TLR9 knockout derived B cells, in con especially in constituting the activated compartments um, of the animal. So B cells lacking TLR9 pre preferentially activate um, compared to TLR9 wild type B cells. Now we can look at the T P915H versus the TLR9 wild type. Remember, the only thing that's missing in the P915H is the MIDI88 signaling. Here, the wild type is going up. And what, like during development, you don't really see much. But when once you look at age-associated B cells, memory cells, plasma blasts, and plasma cells, um, it's easy to see that the wild type is, is cell intrinsically favored here compared to the P915H. And then um, perhaps as interesting, is the TLR9 knockout, but maybe not surprising, um, versus the P915H. And again, here, there's no protein, whereas here we've just got pure regulatory function. And this is where you see the most extreme um, advantage for the TLR9 knockout, um, it, particularly in the peripheral antigen-driven compartments like memory cells, ABCs, plasma blasts, and uh, plasma cells. Now, we were also looking at this, and I just don't have time to go into like the RNA-seq and ATAC-seq that we did. Um, if you're interested, um, you'll see it in the paper, but 
this is just showing the flow cytometry. So this is like an, an Aurora um, high dimensional panel looking at a lot of different B cell markers. And what we learned from this is that the age associated B cells, which are associated with and probably driving disease in lupus, as well as plasma cells that arise from the P915H versus the nine knockout cells are actually different from each other. Even though they, we, we gate them in the same way, when you actually look at their marker expression, they're different. And this is um, <clears throat> a UMAP type of plot of the multidimensional flow where this is now gated on ABC cells. And you can see that the TLR9 knockout is populating this part of the map whereas the P915H is populating a very different part of the map. And the wild type gives you cells in both areas. So when you overlay them, it's easy to see that the, this whole left part of the map is really coming from the P915H and the right part of the map is coming from the TLR9 knockout. And the same goes for plasma blasts. Easy to see that in the overlay that this, this area here is coming from the P915H and that this area is mostly coming from the TLR9 knockout. Now, these are cells that are, as far as anyone would be concerned, they fit into the gate of ABCs and plasma blasts. And I'm not gonna have, go into the details of the markers here, but this is just showing some of the different markers like PD-1, which is um, <clears throat> overexpressed in the P915H plasma blast, for example, um, that are driving these differences. Uh, and basically it looks like they're, ABCs and plasma blasts from the nine knockout are more pro-inflammatory, whereas the P915H ones are more regulatory. Now, remember, these are all coming from the same exact milieu. They're from the bone marrow chimeras. So their environment that they're soaking in is not the reason for these differences, but rather the cell intrinsic differences in the way that their TLR9 molecules signal. All right, so last little part of the talk. How then can TLR9 differentially regulate disease. So we've come up with all these different parts, the scaffold function, cryptic, my 88 signaling, um, a, a putative uh, reg regulatory module, but the sort of the elephant in the room in a way is that could TLR7 actually signal more strongly than my 88 Evidence is sort of pointing that way, but there was no direct um, testing of this particular part. So to test this particular part, we made a new series of mice, and this is the unpublished data. And I, I just want to remind you that I showed you up earlier in the talk, this notion that you know maybe there really has to be a difference in the way that these TLR7 molecules signal, even if there's three of them, than this mixture of two TLR9 molecules and one TLR7 molecule. And that that would give you more effector functions here uh, than here. So to test that, we developed chimeric molecules between TLR7 and TLR9, where we just swapped out the tier domain of TLR9 with the tier, for the tier domain of TLR7. So we call this 997. So TLR9 um, ligand recognition domain, TLR9 transmembrane domain, but this molecule has the tier domain of TLR7. Hope everybody's with me. If I could see you, I would read your faces, but I can't. <clears throat> so the prediction of this is that if we look at these animals and they have exacerbated disease, then the tier domains have different signaling qualities because there's nothing different about these animals except literally the TLR7 tier domain is now taking the place of the TLR9 tier domain. But if they have similar lupus, then the idea is wrong. The tier domains are the same and the answer lies elsewhere. Now to simplify all this, we knocked out TLR7 in all these animals. So the only TLR7 tier domain in this mouse is linked to the TLR9 molecule uh, in the TLR9 locus. And this is what the uh, phenotypes of the mice look like and just showing you some of it. So the mutant here, which has the tier domain um, in the, uh, of TLR7 is in purple and the control is in white here. You can see the spleen weights are much bigger. The glomerulonephritis is substantially greater and the interstitial nephritis is quite a bit greater. So these mice have exacerbated disease. So this one difference is driving exacerbated disease. And that was a really cool finding, I thought. <clears throat> but you could also reverse the process. Um, if the idea is correct, then generation of chimeric TLRs to test if TLR7 and TLR9 
um, have different signaling qualities can be done in this way, where we put the TLR9 regulatory or tier domain uh, rather into the TLR7 locus um, in a reciprocal way. And remember, we're hypothesizing that this has regulatory properties. So the um, prediction of this mouse would be uh, if lupus is ameliorated, then the tier domains are different and the TLR9 tier is critical for providing protection. Whereas if the, tier, if the disease is not any different, then these tier domains actually function uh, just the same. And this is the phenotype of the mice. My, like in my head, I always say, like if somebody is showing you this kind of stuff, there obviously was a big phenotype because they're they want to show you how much bigger the spleen is or the lymph nodes are. But suffice it to say that when you not when you just put the TLR9 tier domain um, into TLR7, the mice do get ameliorated disease. In fact, um, it's not distinguishable from a TLR7 knockout, really. Um, and interstitial nephritis, which is the most TLR7 driven part of the disease in our experience. Um, is really much, pretty much extinguished. So that's all the data that I want to show. I'm just going to run through a few conclusions of the talk and just a few future directions, and then I'll be done. Um, <clears throat> so first, I showed you that TLR9 has a MID88 independent and ligand independent protective effect, the so-called scaffold function, um, and that was demonstrated by the K51E mutant, for example. Um, TLR9 has a MID88 independent, but ligand dependent protective effect. Um, and that was based on the differences that I showed you between the K51E and the P915H. Remember, these were more protected. And we also have a lot of ATAC and RNA-seq and high dimensional flow that sort of fleshes out the differences uh, here and why that is the case. And then TLR9 has a cryptic, and despite the fact that overall it's regulatory, it is also pro-inflammatory, um, and maybe that's something to be expected, but we could show that based on the differences between the TLR9 wild type and the P915H um, knockouts, where these are more protected, um, and the only difference is these can't signal through MID88. This has, this has all the rest of the properties. Uh, the chimeras that I went over briefly, they show that these effects are B-cell intrinsic um, and pretty dramatic. Um, and then just sort of gone backwards, remember I talked about the Miyake hypothesis and the absence of TLR9 does not increase TLR7 expression or signaling in B cells. So that really makes it hard to use the Miyake hypothesis to explain all the data. Um, and then lastly, I just showed you that chimeric TLR molecules in which the tier domains are switched serve to map the protection and promotion of lupus to these two tier domains because those are the only differences between those mice. And let me just leave you with some things we're thinking about, some further questions. So, you know, more broadly, these TLRs didn't really evolve to make or not make lupus, but they actually evolved maybe to uh, protect you um, it, with innate immunity from viral or bacterial infections without producing lupus. So why did this different biology evolve? Um, in terms of signaling, and what does that really mean for pathogen recognition as well as autoimmunity? And I think this is just a thought question at the moment. Um, something I didn't address is, are there different roles for the autoantigens themselves? Is like DNA somehow a different kind of more, less pro-inflammatory ligand than TLR7, than, T than RNA, because RNA is usually degraded all the time, whereas DNA is around. Um, and we're making additional chimeric molecules to further test that. <clears throat> What is this regulatory pathway? I mean, I've only implied it uh, by loss of function and uh, I haven't really shown you anything about what it is. And we need biochemical and genetic analysis of the tier domains um, using mutants and chimeras and then in vivo genetic approaches. And this is something that Claire Liebler is now taking on in her own lab. Um, she is in Bordeaux uh, in France now. <clears throat> and why is K51E protective? I mean, I just called it a scaffold function, but that's just a wastebasket idea. Um, what is it really doing? Could TLR9 protein per se be doing something else like regulating BCR signaling? Uh, there's a lot of options there, but there, it's a very strong effect. So there has to be a mechanism behind it. And we'd like to figure that out. And um, sort of unspoken is that TLR BCR signaling um, together gives you unique 
unique set of outcomes. And this is built a lot on the work of people like Ann Rothstein uh, and Mike Cancro, for example. So how do these specific TLRs interact with BCR signaling and B cells to affect the outcome? And I'm gonna just come full circle. I already showed you Claire. She generated a lot of this uh, in vivo data. This project was started by Shinu John when I was still at Yale and Shinu did make some of the, and test some of the first chimeric molecules. Sean and Kevin did the earlier work that set the stage for all this. <clears throat> uh, Anne Rossi, and I just mentioned her, is my longstanding collaborator in all this work. Um, and, and some of the, you know, our mouse embryo, like we were able to make all these mutants directly in MRL LPR. So that saved us a lot of time. If you're interested in that kind of service, get in touch with me, we can, we can help you uh, collaboratively or just make mice for you. And I will stop there, thank you. Thank you so <clears throat> much, Mark. Wow, <laughs> that was a genetics to the force. Beautiful work, super interesting also the specificity of the tier domains. Thank you so much. So now I will remind our viewers that you can ask many questions, all the questions that you want to mark via mm -hmm. Twitter. So please go to Twitter or to X, to our global mm -hmm. Immunotox account. You'll find a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Mark Shlomchik, sorry, here. And then make sure you mm -hmm. reply to that tweet with your question and mention the hashtag global immuno and uh, the Twitter handle M Shlomchik, which is the one that Mark is going to use. Yeah, so, spell it right. Otherwise, I won't get it. Yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> so you have time. Look it up. Yeah, <laughs> after being so many decades, your colleagues. Sometimes yeah, and, and everyone, feel it. free. I, I'd be very happy to respond to you, or if you want to just do it through email or whatever. If you want to contact me about collaborations or ideas or thoughts or working with me or getting mice, whatever, I'm very open to uh, people contacting me and I will Thank definitely you. get back to you. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate that. You know, we sometimes feel we're many people, but you know, it's not such a large community. So we are like a family and I'm sure they can reach out to you and ask you many questions. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you again next week. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks. Thank thank you, Carla, and uh and on all the organizers. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.